So it's Friday. Markets are in turmoil, but uh, of course, in the in the last half hour of trading, we are off the lows. Um, S and P sitting at about thirty six ninety as we speak. Um, it'll probably close somewhere in the neighborhood there. Um, maybe it'll get back to thirty seven hundred, but uh, you know, it doesn't really matter for the moment. Things are bad. They're going to get worse. Uh, market cap to GDP is still around like 150%, which was a record high not too long ago. We got up to 200%, um, leveled off, and it's been downhill ever since. The mean, the long-term average uh, for market cap to GDP used to be around 75%, um, and you know, for a, a, a market crash, you would expect market cap to GDP to end up somewhere between 50 to 75 percent. Um, but because we've run so hot for so long, it's actually brought the, the long term average up to uh, around 85 percent. And so even if we just revert back to that still very uh, low mean or very high mean, the S&P, I think, would still have to fall you know, below 2400. So basically back at the um, at the, the March of 2020 lows. Uh, that's where the stock market would have to end up in order for this uh, crash um, to, you know, to really hit a solid bottom. That, of course, is assuming that the Fed does not flip-flop first. That is always possible, but uh, the S&P has lost uh, more than 1,000 points since its peak uh, back in, uh, you know, February of this year. Um, and so I think that it is... Uh, reasonable to suspect that the S&P could still lose another thousand points from here. And even then, I think we would still be pretty high. I think we'd probably be around 100% market cap to GDP if we, if, uh, uh, we lost another thousand points from here. And I cite that not because I'm one of these like Warren Buffett uh, fanatics. I'm not a fan of Warren Buffett at all. Um, but, uh, you know, and this, uh, this indicator is known as the Buffett indicator by the media, uh, it's just, it's a good indicator. Um, it's rational. It makes sense. The stock market is supposed to have some relationship. Uh, it's supposed to have some link to the underlying economy. And we have never seen a stock market that is more detached from the underlying economy than this one. And the same is true for the bond market and for the housing market. The bond market is in free fall. Um, the 10 year yield this morning was at like 3.8%. It's come off those highs now. I think we're down in the 3.6x range. Meanwhile, the dollar index is uh, sitting around what? I think 113 last I checked. Yes, it was just, it was exactly 113. I guess that was a good guess on my part. And this is wreaking all sorts of havoc around the world. Um, uh, the yen is having a very tough time as some of you may know. And um, it's not clear, at least to me, because I just, I don't have an, a, a deep enough knowledge base or deep and a broad enough knowledge base um, to really know how much damage this is going to cause um, in various financial markets around the world. Um, you know, who's going to start going belly up. But uh, the pain is palpable. Jerome Painwell, uh, I think is getting his wish he is going to be inflicting pain on the global economy. But I will praise him slightly uh, for putting America first and not allowing uh, the, uh, the pain that this is going to cause uh, for the global economy um, to overshadow uh, his attempt to try and bring down inflation in the domestic U.S. economy. I mean, Powell has overtly said that the point of this policy is to increase the unemployment rate and bring down wages. And sadly, you know, like, it's tough for me because I see the Fed, you know, like they're being hawkish. I should be happy about this. Uh, you know, but at the same time, this I think this has the potential to backfire in the future, because I think that the Fed's the Fed will be able to bring about an increase in the unemployment rate and a decrease in real wages, but 
government spending is not slowing down. MMT is marching on, unabated. Congress is not playing along with the Fed. And considering that it was the CARES Act and the, the STEMI checks and all of this nonsense that has happened since March of 2020 that kicked off uh, this bout of ceaseless inflation, I don't think that it's enough for the Fed just to crush the American worker. You have to crush Congress as well. Congress is the main culprit here. Uh, if um, if workers have been seeing you know mild increases in pay, I s don't think that that has made up for all the inflation uh, that the federal government has created through its uh, deficit spending. And the Fed hasn't really addressed this at all. The Fed is acting like we'll just raise rates, and that will be enough. Now. If the Fed really raised rates and they crushed Congress, which, you know, hey, Treasury Treasury yields are rising significantly, that could put a, could the, put the brakes on Congress. If Congress is unable to finance uh, its massive deficits and they have to allocate more and more tax dollars just to paying down the interest on the debt, well, then actually the Fed would be able to achieve its goal. But I mean, that would mean that the Fed would have to raise rates to such an extent that it would lead to federal budget cuts. We've never seen in my lifetime the federal government cut its budget. They've only cut the rate of growth of the budget. But they've never reduced spending year over year. That doesn't happen in America. Yet that's exactly what must happen in order uh, for uh, inflation to get under control, in order for inflation to... Um, get back down to that 2% target that the Fed still uh, is somehow able to articulate with a straight face. Okay, it's uh, 4 o'clock. The market's just closed. I, ch I double-checked. Uh, the S&P closed uh, 36.93. So yeah, we're off the lows. The lows were like 36.76, I think. Um, that was the lowest I saw. So not too far off the lows. Um, we are below 3,700. And we're now well into bear market territory. I think we're, we might be like 22% down now. Um, 20, the 20% 20 mark was 38.50, if I remember correctly. And now we're at 36.93. So we're more than 150 points into a bear market. Now, if only the housing market could crash this fast. Boy, wouldn't that be swell? <laughs> Gosh. But hey, you know what? I hope this keeps up. I love that assets are crashing. Um, because people who save their money, who hang on to cash, which, you know, that is a good thing. That is a good habit people should do. The Fed has done everything over the past few decades to make saving money the stupidest thing you can do and to disincentivize people from uh, engaging in good, rational economic behavior. Saving money is something that responsible people do, but the Fed has done their best to try and make savers chumps. But those of us who save as much money as we can despite that, despite the fact that you're better off just spending your money before it can be inflated away, may be rewarded in this crash if asset prices uh, fall through the floor because we may be able to pick them up. Unfortunately, though, it's probably going to be mostly the big guys, just like it was last time. Uh, the big guys are the ones who have cash on hand to swoop in and pick up the pieces when things crash. But nevertheless, I have been trying to stockpile cash um, over the last couple years uh, myself. This is not financial advice, but that's what I've been trying to do. I've been trying to stay liquid because, you know, even though I don't have much money to my name, you know, I am pretty young, um, I did think that there would be a good buying opportunity and that I could actually, you know, make some slight investments. And I'm not talking about, you know, speculating in uh, in, uh, in commodities or something like that. I mean actual investments, things that I would want to own, uh, you, know, for, uh, you know, for years to come. You know, and already now, I mean, some of your uh, fixed income instruments are looking, you know, somewhat attractive. I mean, fixed income was dead last year, and 
over the last couple of years. I mean, if you wanted to just go, if you had cash, if you were someone who was at the end of your, if you were 65 and you had uh, money that you wanted to stop growing, that you just wanted to put in to generate income, you know, you want to go out and buy some bonds and cl and clip coupons. You didn't really have an option for that. Even if you went for junk bonds, uh, you were you were lucky to beat inflation. And while still you have negative real rates, um, the picture is not as bad as it used to be. It is in real terms, but inflation, it will come down. If you're able to lock in the, these higher yields now, or even better, if yields continue to rise, which I think they will, maybe next year, if you're someone who's, you know, liquid with, uh, I don't know, a couple hundred thousand dollars, you might be able to move that. Um, now, you couldn't live off of a hundred, a couple hundred thousand dollars, but you could put that in um, some fixed income instrument and get a decent yield and get some money. So maybe you could live, you know, by not working as much as you used to and you're able to, you know, collect some money aside there. I know that's really off topic for this channel, but my point is to say there are up, there are silver linings to all this. Fundamentally, the crash needs to happen, and it's not all bad. You can avoid getting hit by the train if you watch for the signals. And at the end of the day, it is the elites who own assets in this country, and so an asset uh, price crash is going to hurt them a lot more than it hurts us. But right now, we're barely in a bear market. A bear market is not enough. Stonks need to crash by 50% from their highs. Um, so again, like I said, around 2,400. And I think that's a starting point. Um, if this were, I could easily see that go, getting down closer, um, you know, to 2,200. That is in a just, in a, you know, in a free market. <laughs> Which, I mean, we don't have a free market. But in a free market, that's where the prices would go. Uh, stonks would fall to 2200 because they're not worth – Stonk uh, – the S&P was never worth 4818 It's not worth 3700 now. A thousand square foot, two-bedroom house with a one-car garage is not worth $350,000. It's not worth it today. wasn't worth it a month ago, and it won't be worth it in a year. The housing market um, needs to experience a similar crash to stonks in order to get back down to uh, the long-term average, in order to revert to the mean. Because uh, mortgage rates at 6% and rising are not going to sustain 1,000-square-foot uh, houses with one-car garages uh, selling for $350,000. Unless it's like a really, really, really nice neighborhood. <laughs> Particularly when you factor in people are losing their jobs and they're going to be losing wages. Their wages are going to fall. So not only will they be able to qualify for a lower principal because interest rates are rising and that's going to eat up more of their monthly payment. More of their monthly payment is going to go to interest and they're going to have less to put down towards the principal. But also they're going to be – they're not going to be able to afford as big of a monthly payment. They're going to be able to afford – a smaller monthly payment, as well as um, paying more interest. And so housing is done. If you had a house to sell, I hope you sold it. Um, but if you're like most people, you didn't have anywhere to go anyway. So you're better off just trying to sit tight. God willing, we will never see a ridiculous bubble like this again. Housing should not be this volatile. We should not have a housing bubble uh, that goes up and comes down um, every few years. You don't want to ha be in a position where people have to wait until uh, you know we're in a depression to buy a house every time because that's the only time that housing prices are in line with their long-term average. You know, I didn't even want to talk about this today. I wanted to talk about Matt Gates being exonerated and how I think that Joel Greenberg um, was potentially an Epstein type of. Um, blackmail character, someone in the mold of Epstein or Roy Cohn or J. Edgar Hoover. It's just a little theory I have, um, but I'm not going to get into it today. But what you do need to know is that Matt Gates is off the hook. It was never true. 
um, and they couldn't even get a grand jury in Orlando, a big blue city in Florida. They couldn't even get a grand jury there to indict him because this ex-girlfriend that they found and Joel Greenberg were so um, uh, incredible, discredible. It's the right word there. Essentially, there there was no evidence that uh, he ever engaged in any sort of lewd acts with an underage person, and uh, the two witnesses who claimed it um, were apparently not considered to be credible um, by the grand jury. And so that's good news for us because, um, you know, Matt Gates, until that uh, unfortunate story came out, had a pretty bright future ahead of him in Florida politics, um, and I would like him to be sitting there on the bench for when DeSantis is no longer around. Because we do have term limits in this state, this will be DeSantis's last term, and uh, you know he might, he, depending on what happens to Trump, uh, DeSantis might be running for president in 24, in which case uh, we'll need a replacement even sooner, and it'd be nice uh, if, Matt, if Matt Gates is uh, on deck for that. Because uh, I would hate to see DeSantis of all people followed up by uh, you know some establishment hack. I want to keep things going. I hope that we start an anti-establishment dynasty in this state. I want to start a tradition uh, where all of our governors uh, essentially are in the DeSantis mold and that DeSantis is not uh, just a one-off, that he's not an accident of history. Because if we get, you know, once we get two guys like that in a row, then everyone will realize, okay, that's how I have to campaign for governor. That's how I have to govern this state in order to be successful. Especially once this country starts to fall apart, which I could very well see happening before the 2024 election. Um, we need to make sure that, of course, if it happens before 2024, we'll have DeSantis anyway. But I have been thinking since the 2018 election that I want somebody to be the governor of this state who... I think would pull the trigger on a national divorce if it came down to it once it became inevitable. Because that's how it's going to happen. It's not that people you know, are just going to decide one day, you know what, I think we'd be better off you know, as an independent country rather than a part of the U.S. It's not going to happen like that. Um, the federal government is going to collapse. And there's going to have to be a decision made. Are we going to try and build this? Are we going to try and rebuild the federal government, recreate a new federal government, or are we just going to say to cut our losses and go out on our own? And when that time comes, I want to make sure that the governor of Florida is somebody who says it's time to cut our losses. And it could, you know, something as simple as uh, the servicing the interest on the debt would bring down the federal government. I mean, 5% on the 10-year would be the end of America. We're at 3.6% now. We were at 3.8 this morning. So think of it that way. Um, if we were at 3.8 this morning and we're at 3.6 now, well, you could just as easily go from 3.8 to 4. And 4%, that's 1% away from 5%. And it would have to be sustained at that. It would have to stay there, stay high like that for quite a while. Um, I don't think the Fed would do that. I think that the Fed... Uh, would almost certainly do uh, everything in its power to keep the United States from going bankrupt. But if the Fed loses control of the yield curve, which I don't think they've got a great grasp over it right now, the federal government will be done. It'll be over. And if we go through another financial crisis, um, who knows what will happen? And I think another crisis you know, um, on the level of 2008 – most likely worse, is in the cards for the next couple of years. Things are already bad now, um, but it does take time for the situation to really deteriorate and to break down into uh, you know, an existential crisis. Uh, I think it'll be interesting to see what happens if we have big banks or similar institutions collapse this time around. There will be zero political will to help bail them out at all. Um, bailouts were unpopular the last time, but people were tricked into thinking that they were necessary. They were still angry about them, but this time people are not going to tolerate that. There will be um, 
I, I'm not advocating this. I am predicting that if we have another 2008 situation, and there are again bailouts for, uh, you know, the too big to fail billionaire-owned institutions, while people are unemployed, uh, losing their homes, uh, and st uh, at the same time still unable to afford a home because housing prices will still be too high. Um, there will be riots in the streets over that. Uh, just like, um, I don't think I predicted the riots of 2020, but I, at the time um, when the riots were going on, you know, I was saying I wasn't surprised that they were going on because you lock people in their homes, they're gonna go a little stir crazy and they're gonna find an excuse to, to essentially break out of that um, house arrest. I think the same will be true if we go into a depression and they try to bail everything out again. Um, that will be people's excuse to vent their uh, their frustration with their own situation. So with that said, I will see you folks back here tomorrow.